So let me tell you about the problem that this talk is about. So if you've got some finite language, but unlike most finite languages, it's, well, except English and other real languages, it's uh, ordered, not totally, but partially. So some elements will be comparable, some not. So you've got an order on letters, that will give you an order on words by the normal dictionary order. I've got some language. How big can uh, sets be inside that language um, such that any two elements of my set are incomparable? Well, obviously the answer in general will be infinity, so to get a sort of good question, we should ask about the part of the language of words of length n. So then for each n, this will be some finite number, and the question is how does it grow as n grows? Um, and yeah, so the size of the, in, in general, for, in the theory of partially ordered sets, the size of the biggest anti chain is called the width. So that's the reason for the title of the talk. So the problem is, if I give you a language, and typically it will be some special family of language, like regular languages or context-free, uh, we want to know how the width grows with n. So that's just writing down the lexicographic order. And I should just remark, for me, um, the dictionary order, the lexicographic order will put, pre will put prefixes before suffixes. So if a is a prefix of b, then a is below b. But of course, that doesn't actually affect the, this problem because we're only um, interested in length n, um, but it's more convenient. OK, so why are you supposed to care about this problem? Well, one reason is that it's a sort of moderately natural generalization of quite a classical problem, which is just if I give you a language, how many words does it have of length n? And in particular, something which has been independently published about nine times or something is that well, sometimes for context-free languages, sometimes just for regular languages, is that if you have, a, well, even a context-free language, then this grows either like an exponential in n or just like a polynomial in n. And of course, our problem generalizes this because this is just our problem where partial order makes everything incomparable. So everything of fixed length is an antichain. OK, so that's motivation sort of one. The other motivation is more practical, which is computer security. So um, in real life, you might be sort of running your computer programs on some computer which you share with, some, with an untrusted party, and we're interested in controlling how much information can get from you to them about sort of what you're doing, your password or whatever. So, so the kind of setup is that Alice and Bob are interacting with some shared system which we'll sort of think of as some kind of finite state machine, and they provide inputs and get outputs. So maybe, you know, maybe this is the thing on your computer which allocates memory. So you send things saying, please give me some memory. And it says, here you are, or no, I don't have any. Um, so a long time ago, in a sort of very classic paper in security, Gogun and Messiger um, gave a definition of what it means for there to be no information flow from Alice to Bob. Um, and basically, that says that what, what uh, Bob gets to see doesn't depend on what Alice did. So whenever Bob provides the same inputs, he gets the same outputs. OK, and our, and our goal here is that we want to make this quantitative. So maybe, maybe it's too much to ask that Alice doesn't affect Bob at all, because you know, if Alice were not there, then Bob could have all the memory to himself. But if she is, then he only gets sort of roughly half of the memory. So maybe that's too strong a property. And what we want to be able to say is some information can get to Alice, can get to Bob, but not too much. So that, that, that's the um, other motivation. And what that has to do with this is that the kind of another story is that um, that problem actually reduces to this problem. Um, if you uh, put, if you, you can sort of construct a certain automaton, given the specification of the system, you can construct an automaton which is sort of uh, Bob's view of the system if you view Alice's actions as non-deterministic. And then it turns out, then what you want to do is sort of count sets of observations that Bob might make, but subject to the constraint that they have to be sort of consistent, because there has to be some strategy for Bob which tells him what to do at each step, which allows all these strategies to be realized by Alice. And what that consist consistency condition sort of ends up being is exactly that the set of words you're looking at as an anti-chain in this partial order. Yeah, so answering this question of how much information gets to Bob is exactly answering this question of how big an anti-chain can be. OK, so that's the motivation. OK, plan, let's, the plan of the talk is I'll just tell you some kind of basic 
definitions and some basic facts about interchains, which are going to be useful later on. Then I'll talk about the results on regular languages, then context-free languages. Um, then I'll talk about, well, maybe, so uh, we saw that the big thing for language growth was um, there's a di di dichotomy between uh, polynomial and exponential, and we'll see the same thing for antichains. But maybe you want to know more. Maybe you don't want just want to know it's polynomial. You want to know is it n squared or n cubed or whatever. So we'll talk a bit about that. Uh, fine, there's a similar thing for tree languages, which I probably won't have time to talk about very much. And then one of the nicest things about this is that there are lots of quite appealing open problems. So I'll talk about those as well. OK, so I mean, yeah, so definitions. I guess you know what an antichain is. It's something where no two elements are comparable. Um, a chain is kind of the opposite of an antichain. It's something where everything is comparable. Uh, sometimes an antichain is going to be too strong for us. So we'll also talk about quasi-antichains, which are like antichains, except uh, they might have prefixes, which in the lexicographic order are comparable, but we're going to sort of imagine they're not comparable. OK, so and we're interested in sort of quantitative bounds on things. So we, we'll say a language is polynomial if, it, if its number of words of length n is only polynomial, and exponential if it's exponential. Um, so in particular, what we're interested in is how this width thing grows, and I'll also call that antichain growth. So a, a sufficient condition to have exponential antichain growth is that you should contain an antichain which is exponential. That's a sufficient condition, but it's not a necessary condition because it could be that the antichain you want to consider at each length n is sort of completely different. Um, so it could be that you, uh, yeah, you're, you have exponential antichain growth, but actually you don't contain an exponential antichain. OK, so, well, regular languages are all about uh, union, concatenation, and clean star. So we probably want to have some theory, theorems about them. Well, union, it's sort of obvious what happens for things like polynomial exponential antichain growth. I mean, finite union doesn't really do anything to that. So sort of let's leave that aside. Um, concatenation, antichains behave, ni behave nicely. If you concatenate two antichains, you get another antichain. And also, if you have the control of the antichain growth of L1 and of L2, then you get sort of quantitative control on the antichain growth of L1 and L2. OK, so that's, that's concatenation. What about clean star? Well, there's no hope of getting a version of this for clean star, because after all, L star is going to contain lots of prefixes. So it can't be true that L, uh, if L is an antichain, then L star is an antichain. But we, the next best thing is true. It, it's an antichain apart from those prefixes, which means it's a quite antichain. And actually, that's kind of good enough for government work, because if what you care about is polynomial versus exponential, a quasi-antichain is just as good as an antichain because you can. Um, there's a kind of sort of Ramsey theory type argument that says that um, if you are an exponential anti quasi-antichain, then actually you contain an exponential antichain. Okay, so let's let's just talk about language growth for a moment, and then we'll see how we sort of adapt the arguments that are used for language growth to. Um, Antichain growth. So the kind of critical condition for languages is that you want to ask for each state, let's look at the language of words that I can get by following some path starting at Q and getting me back to Q. And so I'll call that automaton, i.e. my original automaton, but where I have to start and end at Q, A sub Q, Q. And the critical question is, is it the case that the language of that automaton is a subset of W star for some word W. That, pro that property is called being commutative. And the critical point is that if, if that is commutative for all Q, then your automaton has polynomial language growth. And if not, then it has um, exponential language growth. And that's easy to prove, because if there is some Q, obviously I mean a relevant Q, i.e. for which you can get to it from the starting state, and you can get to an accepting state from it. Um, if there's some Q which is not for which LAQQ is not commutative, then you can take two words in that language which are not prefixes of each other, and then you know W1 plus W2 star is an exponential language because W1 and W2 are not prefixes, and then you put something on the beginning and the end to get you from a an initial state to a final state, and so you have an exponential growth set inside your language. On the other hand, if they are always commutative, then you can say, well, suppose I had a word in my language it sort of beetles around, visits the starting state a few times, but then 
after, after some point, it never visits the starting state again. So by induction, after that, I'm in a sort of polynomial size thing. And the thing that I get starting and going back to the initial state for the last time is W star. So overall, I live inside W1 star, W2 star, up to W2k star for some W1 up to Wk. And that's manifestly polynomial. So that proves that. So in some sense, if we want to make a similar argument, we need a sort of anti and partial order version of being commutative. So we're going to want some condition on LAQQ, which ensures we have polynomial antichain growth, and which, if it fails, gives us exponential antichain growth. And it turns out that what that what you want that oh yeah I, sorry I should have said you can de decide this in linear time. Um, yeah, and it turns out that what you want that condition to be is LAQQ being a chain. So every two elements of LAQQ um, being comparable. Okay, well, why is that? Well, it, well, if it's not a chain, then you have two incomparable elements. Uh, that means that W1 plus W2 is an antichain. Therefore, W1 plus W2 star is a quasi antichain. Therefore, by our lemma, there's an exponent, and it's exponential, of course. And therefore, by our lemma, there is an exponential antichain. And then, if you stick something on the front and the end to get you from the start to the end, as before, you get an exponential antichain. Uh, so, in fact, the conclusion of that is that for regular languages, actually, if you have exponential antichain growth, then you do um, have an exponential antichain. So, the thing I said at the beginning could happen actually can't happen. Okay, now the converse, uh, a similar argument works. You can say, well, uh, Anything, for anything in my language, um, I'm sort of going around and visiting Q, the starting state a few times, then I do something else, then I never visit the starting state again. Okay, well, that's a chain um, by assumption. A, well, it's a singleton, so it's certainly a chain. Um, so that means these both have polynomial antichain growth because they're chains, i.e. antichains all have size 1. Then And then this this language, which is the language that we get never visiting uh, the starting state again, by induction also has polynomial antichain growth. That means by our lemma, um, this whole thing has a polynomial antichain growth. So we're done. So that proves the main thing. OK. And then what if you want to actually check that for a given automaton? Well, you can do it. You can, basically, you can make some, you can build some little automaton B, which accepts only kind of uh, synchronized interleavings of words which are incomparable because, you, you know, what does incomparable mean? It means look at the point where they differ for the first time. Are those by comparable letters or by incomparable letters? And that's clearly something you can check with an automaton. Um, and then once you've done that, you just say, well, let's look at the interleaving of two copies of AQQ for each Q, uh, where, um, and then see if that has empty intersection with B or not. And that's, of course, in polynomial time. OK, what about context-free languages? Again, the language growth question here is cl classical. Um, and there's kind of a quite similar condition. You, instead of looking at LAQQ, you say, so pick some non for each non-terminal, I want to look at the words I can get in productions that start at that non-terminal and end up with that non-terminal. So I get some sort of a word on the left, non-terminal, word on the right. So what's the set of words U that can be on the left for some W? And then similarly for the right. And again, what I care about is whether this, these things are commutative. And then the proof is kind of similar in both directions. OK, so I guess what you might guess is that when I care about antichain growth, I want to say I care about left and right A being a chain by every A. But that's actually not right. Um, we need a slight, um, slightly more fine version of that. We want left, we care about left being a chain, and then not right A, but right sub W A, by which I mean I'm asking for each fixed W I might get on the left, what words can I get on the right? So left A, right A is the same as this, where uh, w is existentially quantified, but now I'm looking at one fixed W, what things can I get on the right? Um, okay, so how do you prove that this is necessary and sufficient? Well, if left, if you can get an antichain, 
if you can get things which are incomparable on the left, then it's easy to show you can get an actual anti-chain. Uh, if right WA is not a chain for some W and some A, it's a bit more delicate because you might, when, when you sort of combine many, you know, when you want to concatenate the things you're getting on the right, you're also getting stuff on the left, and you have to ask sort of how does the stuff on the left compare to the stuff on the right. But you can show that actually you get an anti-chain family, so you get um, a set where uh, the words of any fixed length are, um, are incomparable. And in fact, so, so now the thing I said could happen can happen. And in fact, it's very easy to think of an example of a context-free language um, where it has exponential interchain growth, but all interchains are indeed finite. OK, but yeah, so this proves that there's similarly, similar dichotomy because, of course, in the other direction, you do a similar kind of induction. You say, I might use A for the, up to some point, and then after that, I never use it again, so done by induction. OK, so that proves that also context-free languages have... Um, a, have a dichotomy between polynomial and exponential. Okay, um, so yeah, so I briefly said for language growth, the, this, the condition of context free languages is also de decidable in polynomial time, but interestingly, for anti chain growth, that is not so. In particular, it's actually undecidable to determine whether a uh, given context free language has a polynomial or exponential anti chain growth, uh, which you show by reduction from the problem of non-emptiness of intersection of context-free grammars, which the last talk told you was undecidable. Um, so you can reduce that to the problem of uh, determining whether a given context-free language is a chain, and then that you can reduce to the problem of uh, exponential or polynomial anti-chain growth. So that proves that this problem of determining whether a context-free language has polynomial or exponential width is uh, undecidable. So we have this kind of maybe slightly surprising kind of grid where everything for language growth is in polynomial time and everything for NFAs is in polynomial time, but the kind of killer combination of context-free language and anti-chain growth is undecidable. So maybe that's not exactly what we'd expect. Okay, what about exact growth rates? So in particular, in kind of the world of security, maybe it's not very exciting to say it's polynomial, even though that may satisfy the CS theorists, if my, you know, in some sense, log n bits of information in time n might be regarded as safe because, well, I could guess a key at that rate as anyway or something. But if it's a thousand log n, maybe that's not so good. So we'd be interested in knowing whether it's, you know, n or n squared or n cubed or whatever. So for the case of language growth, this is not so bad. And I mean, the reason for that is basically that having polynomial language growth is really a very strong condition. So, um, so in particular, I mean, if, you look, if we look at the uh, transition graph of our automaton, obviously we can sort of think of the strongly connected components uh, kind of independently. And then within each, and, then, and of course there's sort of a dag of those. Um, and within each component, well, everything has to be commutative. So what that really means is that for each component, there's one word such that as you go round and round this component, whatever you do, you're getting something inside W star. And so that means really all you have to keep track of is sort of where you jump on and where you jump off. And then the kind of the complication is that for NFA, you need to be a bit careful to make sure that you can't get the same thing in two ways because, you know, if this component has, well, if this component has W star, Star, and this component has W star for the same W, that doesn't really give you an extra polynomial factor. But modulo that, it's not so bad to keep track of everything and work out what's going on. But for antichains, life is not so good because we don't, we don't have this very, very strong condition that really, within each strongly connected component, only one thing can happen. Um, so, basic, so what we end up doing is you sort of look at your transition graph and you're going to color some edges as sort of special, sort of color them red, let's say. And the, the important thing that we care about is, is it possible uh, to get between these vertices in, such that 
on the one hand, I can get from Q to Q prime, and on the other hand, I can get from Q back to itself um, with a different word, which in particular is incomparable to uh, the word that took me from Q to Q prime. And so if we think about drawing the graph on the states of our automaton, we have sort of some white edges and some red, red edges. And the critical question is, for a path, how many red edges does it go along? Um, because what that sort of means is, every time I see a red edge, I have a free choice of doing W prime some number of times, and then eventually doing W, and sort of moving on with my long-term plan of getting to an accepting state. Um, and of course, it's pretty obvious that there are, there are no cycles involving red edges, because if there were, then you would have exponential growth. Okay, so what we want to do is prove that um, this, this quantity of sort of the number of uh, red edges you can go through on a path is in fact the, um, or after maximizing over paths, is in fact the order of interchain growth. Okay, so uh, it's e as with everything, it's easier to prove this for DFA than NFA. Um, I don't really have time to tell you the, about the details of the proof, but the point is that if you think about uh, words you can get without visiting a red edge, then you get, then you then you have to have that. Those have to have the property that they that antichains in them are only constant size, and this is quite a delicate proof, but um, you can show it. Uh, basic, basically, the the most important idea is if you so you want to say you can't have two different runs that um, are incomparable, but that doesn't quite work. What you want is simple paths, and then you have to take into account the fact that if I have a run which might contain loops, there are many different ways to remove the loops. But you can still show that uh, if you think about not the simple path that a path with loops corresponds to, because there isn't just one, but the set of simple paths, that's still finite. And you can only have one representative of each of those inside your antechain. So that proves that your antechain is finite. So that's sort of the vague intuition. OK. so that. That tells us what we want to do for DFA. Now we'd like to prove this also for NFA. And the way you prove that is maybe a bit surprising. You actually don't do it directly, but you recall that this quantity DA is well defined for both DFA and NFA. We just haven't shown that for NFA it corresponds to antichain growth. So the way we prove that is we show that this is actually a property of the language. So if I have two NFA which generate the same language, then this quantity is the same for both. And in particular, that means, given an NFA, I can look at its determinization. That's a DFA, and it generates the same language as my original NFA. Therefore, the antechain growth of that language must be D sub A prime, let's say, where A prime is the determinization, which must be equal to D sub A, which is what I wanted. So that proves that this thing of like how many red edges can be in a path is indeed the antechain growth for NFA. And okay, and it's easy to see that um, for that uh, you can compute this in polynomial time because, well, what you want to know is which are the red edges. And you can do that with a similar kind of make an automaton ask about emptiness thing that, I, that you could do for the um, dichotomy problem. So you just do that for each edge, then you, then you have the, gra the graph, and then you just want to find the longest path with red edges, which is an easy problem, kind of just a flood fill. OK, so that shows that you can do this in polynomial time. OK, then there's something about, well, you get a similar thing for, you can talk about regular tree languages, and you can define a sort of analog of the lexicographic order on trees. And if you do that, then what you find is that growth is either polynomial exponential or doubly exponential, so like 2 to the 2 to the n. Um, and the kind of main idea there is you need a you need a sort of analog of AQQ for trees, and it turns out that what you want is sort of what I have referred to as pairs of trousers. So you want sort of a tree which or kind of a tree context which has a hole at the top and two holes at the bottom with the property that if I uh, if I'm in state Q here and here, then I can also be in state Q here. Um, and yeah, that's the thing that determines whether it's exponential, sing, polynomial exponential, doubly exponential. And I mean, in particular, I'm not, not that it's exactly 
a hard thing, but I'm not sure anyone's actually written down the fact that, um, in particular, if you consider the discrete ordering, this tells you that the language growth for tree languages is polynomial exponential or, or double exponential. So that's a true thing. OK, so that's, that's about it for the results of this paper. Um, but let me tell you about some open problems. Perhaps uh, a question you might be thinking is, well, you talked about exact, you had a section you called exact growth rates, and you talked about exact orders of polynomial growth, but you didn't talk about exact orders of exponential growth. Well, that's the first open problem. Um, and actually, this is quite an embarrassing thing, because as far as I know, no one even knows how to tell what the order of exponential language growth is for an NFA, which is pretty extraordinary, really. Um, so if I, if I give you an NFA, as far as I know, if it has exponentially many words of length n, nobody knows how to find the constant of proportionality. Um, so for DFA, it's kind of easy. You just look at the transition matrix, and then the biggest eigenvalue of that controls the rate of exponential growth. But for, for NFA, that just tells you the number of accepting runs. Um, and it's kind of not clear how to use that idea for DFA. I could also, so, OK, so language growth is known for DFA. Language growth isn't, even language growth isn't known for NFA. But it's also not clear how to use that thing for DFA to find the order of exponential antichain growth for um, DFA. So it, that would, that's also an open problem. OK, uh, another thing is, well, for language growth, actually, so I gave you a polynomial time algorithm, which is basically quadratic. For language growth, you can actually do it in linear time. Can you do that for antichain growth? Um, another thing is, well, again, in sort of in security land, maybe it's not that helpful to know that your system is secure in the asymptotic limit. What you really want to know is, if I run it for a 1,000 time steps, how much trouble am I in? So you might be interested in knowing the exact value of the width for some fixed n. Um, if you're given a DFA, it's sort of easy to do that um, in time polynomial in n in unary. But time polynomial in n in binary, i.e. log of the number of steps, or for an NFA, it's both open. And then a kind of more vague question is, are there other things that you can sort of usefully think about as being antichains with respect to lex for some partial order? Um, I guess the kind of feature is that it's um, any time you're asking about sort of where does the first point of difference come, that's kind of what that's about. So, yeah, that's it. You don't say, but maybe it's an easy consequence, I don't know, if it's possible to decide if there is an infinite condition. Okay, so... Uh, in an infinite antichain, I think that, well, okay, that is easy because um, in, in the polynomial, the order of polynomial growth, if it's zero, that means finite, antichains are finite. If it's one or more, then they're infinite. It's for properly the language, right? Is it, so why is it different for, for NFAs versus DFAs? Like, well, it, well, it's how you're given the, um, how you're given the uh, automaton. So, of course, I mean, you can determinize and pay an exponential cost. So, for decidability, but if you want, if you're asking about polynomial time algorithms, then yeah. So, the order is inherited from whatever order you have on the alphabet, right? Yeah. And uh, so, in case where you don't have, uh, uh, so if you have two letters which are parallel. Mm -hmm. Then you immediately have that uh, all extensions of them are incompatible. Yeah. So that would immediately give you infinite time to change, right? Well, it depends. I mean, in inside sigma star, that's true. But of course, it might not be that. I mean, the question is which ex which extensions are in the language. Okay, but I mean, uh, is it so? There's one case in which I guess it's just a local order where you have a local order on the alphabet. Yeah. This extends to a local order. Yeah. Of, uh, what? Yeah. So then you don't have any antichains at all. Yeah. And then in the other case, you have at least two letters which are incompatible. Yeah. In which case, you have basically a lot of different different antichains. Inside sigma star, yes. Inside sigma star. So uh, why is it so difficult when you go to you know a regular language? So 
what how is it interacting with this? Well, I mean, I mean, I guess ultimately the question is, how does the regular language meet? I mean, so if you have incomparable language letters A plus B, then you're right that A plus B star is an exponential antechain. But I mean, the que well, A, how does this intersect with your language L? And also, it might be that for every, I mean, it might be that for every, well, okay, yeah. So the question is, how does it intersect with your language L, I guess? I mean, the, the whole difficulty of the question is what, what's actually in L and what isn't. Okay, I think the question to be asked. Lunch. Thank you again.